Hi there, folks, and welcome to another update on our volcanic situation in Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Wednesday, December 3rd, looking out at a nice evening there, looking down onto the town of Gorindavik from the mountain Thorpjör. And so um, we're going to look at the latest information from the Met Office, earthquake monitoring data, GPS, INSAR. We'll look at the whole gamut of things. Obviously, the wait continues. It's been a good maybe five months almost, I think, since our last eruption on July 16th. And so I believe this is the longest period between eruptive events since this uh, latest cycle began in December of 2023, so the past two years. Let's go ahead and get right to the Met Office update. So there was an update that came out on the 25th. Uh, so a little bit late here for me, but last week was a holiday week here in the States. Uh, the key points here, the magma continues to accumulate. So the influx of magma beneath uh, the power plant area at Svartsengi, that continues. Um, we still have obviously an, an eruption or an intrusion as the most likely outcome of this magma influx that's going to happen possibly in the next coming weeks, maybe in a few months, could spill over into 2026. Uh, no one knows for sure. Um, and let's get down to some of the information that they shared here. So basically, yeah, the magma influx continues. We have approximately 16 to 17 million cubic meters of magma that's accumulated since the last eruption on July 16th. Um, Seems like this magma influx seems to have slowed a little bit. Um, it's currently at about 1 million cubic meters per second. Um, remember that the total volume that was necessary to erupt on, on July 16th was around 11 to 13 million cubic meters. And so we're, we're well past that threshold. I think we crossed that mark in early October. Um, and so we'll have to see where this goes moving forward. Um, we're definitely in, in a zone where this amount of magma could erupt. It's, it's happened at this level before. We've gone right past that 11 million cubic meter uh, mark. And so we're really just not sure. You know, it might get all the way up to in the past, it's gone up as high as getting down to this next section here, up to 23 million cubic meters. And if we're going to need that kind of volume of magma in order to uh, trigger some sort of eruptive activity, based on the current models, it looks like we might not even get there until early February of 2026. So if it goes for this upper limit here, this higher number, um, might not see that for a few more months. But we're definitely in the zone. We definitely feel like, you know, it could happen at any point, and it's just the waiting game that's, that's a little tricky here. Um, so it's harder to forecast things when we have this slower magma uh, accumulation rate. Again, one cubic meter per second is pretty slow compared to where it's been in the past. Um, and so it's really tricky to forecast exactly when we're going to see any sort of uh, event going on here. Nice graph here showing the modeled influx of magma since the last eruption on July 16th. You can see it's pretty steadily rising through August, September. We, again, we reached that critical 11 million cubic meters of magma threshold. It's like around on October 2nd. And since that time, it's continued to accumulate. But you can see that a little bit of its of this uh, slope of this line starting to decrease just a little bit here. So here we are as of this last update on November 25th. Um, the uplift is continuing, but it definitely has slowed down a little bit. And when we get to the GPS uh, data, I'll show you just how that looks when we compare this latest inflation rate to previous inflation rates with some of the other eruptive events. Um, seismic activity is very low. We'll talk about that here in a second. And they've kept the hazard assessment map the same. So getting over to the earthquakes last 24 hours, um, kind of this is what we typically have seen over the last few months. Um, really nothing going on in the area where we expect the eruption to be uh, near Gorindavik, to the northeast of Gorindavik and to the east of the power plant area. Looks like over the past 24 hours, it was a little, little cluster of quakes here in the offshore region. Pretty typical, again, associated with the movement along this plate boundary. And then over here uh, near, uh, oh, it's not even at Krishivik, a little further to the east over in the Hengil system, looks like we had a few earthquakes again. But again, this is just a 24-hour period, very small snapshot of things. Let's try bumping that down to a little lower level. Yeah, if we go down to like the smaller earthquakes, looks like there was three uh, negative map 
negative magnitude earthquakes around Grindavik. But again, very small numbers of earthquakes in general. This is kind of the pattern we've been seeing over the past few months. If we look a little bit more broadly at the last week, it's pretty much the same. Some of those offshore quakes there. Looks like there was maybe three or four quakes near Grindavik into the northeast, but very small, these magnitudes. Um, like these are, yeah, 1.1, so very small magnitudes in general. Not much, hap much happening near Fagradalsfjall. Uh, and then a little bit more activity, as we've seen, again, near the uh, Vishuvik system, near Lake Klevravat. And so this I thought would be interesting here. Like, let's look at the number of, just look at the earthquake patterns over, well, since the last eruption. So the July 16th eruption ended, I think, on August 5th. At least that's what I have. And so here's all the earthquakes that have been happening on the Reykjanes Peninsula since August 5th. So this is a good, um, I guess, uh, four months of data. You can see the offshore quakes here. Again, when we look around the eruption area, though, even with four months of data, just not a lot there. It's you know maybe a couple dozen quakes, a little bit of a cluster there uh, near the the vent area. These looks like these, a lot of these happened in. Um, Oh, we did have a little flurry. That's right. This was in end of September, early October, I think, is when all of these took place. But again, very low magnitude and you know, much ado about nothing. A few quakes near Grindavik, and then the bigger cluster over here near the uh, Klishevik system. But again, these have not been... Um, the interpretation here is these are not m volcanic or magmatic in origin, or at least they're not causing any sort of uplift or changes at, at the ground deformation level that would suggest that we have anything volcanic about to happen here. Again, there's a lot of faults running through here. When you see earthquakes in general, you should think more about uh, the faults and the tectonic boundary as opposed to a volcano producing those earthquakes. In general, that's a pretty good rule of thumb, I think, for Iceland in general. Of course, there's sometimes where we have more volcanic activity going on, and earthquakes are the main related to those. I thought that'd be interesting to look at over the past four months or so. Um, getting into the GPS data, let's go to this place here and let's go, whoops, are there? Let's go to the Svartsengi station and look at the last year. And I think this is um, kind of what I want to just show here is if we look at the past year, and this is the uplift GPS graph for the Svartsengi station, GPS station. You can see from the, in the aftermath of the November 20th, 2024 eruption, you can see sort of that slope uh, as uplift resumed and more magma was feeding into the system. That led up to the April 1st event, which was mostly an intrusion, but a little bit of an eruption. Uh, then you can see initially that responded as pretty rapid inflation or uplift that kind of petered out a little bit. But look at the slope of the lines on, on these, well, especially this one, I suppose, compared to what we've seen lately. You can just see how much more gentle this slope is, again, indicating we have a much slower rate of influx or magma moving up into the system. A lot of people have compared what we're currently seeing at Svartsengi to the Krapla eruptions up in northern Iceland in the, um, it was in the late 70s or 80s. And there, there were, I think, oh boy, I should have looked this up, but I think it happened over like seven years or eight years, something like that. And there was maybe like eight or nine events. There were several intrusions and a few eruptions. And what they saw with those is that the influx rate did sort of tail off over time as they got closer to the end of that cycle. And that might be what we're seeing here a little bit as well. Again, too early to say for sure, is this going to be the last eruptive event for the time being on the Reykjanes Peninsula? I mean, no one really knows for sure. They could continue to accumulate magma. But what we can say with um, some certainty, just based on what we've seen in the past, is that the time period, uh, lag time, if you will, between eruptive events seems to be getting a little bit longer, which would seem to indicate uh, that perhaps the supply rate of magma is waning a little bit. And so we're seeing that start to slow down a bit as we move forward. We look at like the whole, that might not be that helpful. Yeah, that's not super helpful, too compressed. But um, anyway, uh, let's see, what else? So yeah, GPS is tracking, still showing the inflation. When we go to the latest interferogram, uh, the INSAR data, we can see that as well. Looks like a good, solid 
one full color fringe there. If you look at the, the shade of blue there, out to the blue here. So that's about two and a half centimeters of, excuse me, one and a half centimeters is what the color fringe is. That's about one and a half centimeters of uplift from the 15th of November to the 26th of November, that 11 day period when the satellites went overhead. So we can see and verify with uh, several methods that the inflation continues, the ground uplift is still ongoing. The question, of course, is just, you know, where where this all leads us and, and where this takes us. And so for now, I don't know, what else can I say? The, the wait goes on, and I know a lot of people are um, somewhat eager and or maybe anxious, I suppose is a better word, to see when this occurs, exactly where it occurs, that's going to be a critical factor in how this affects the good folks in Iceland. Will it be closer to uh, Grindavik and really test the berms and sort of these mitigation structures they've been placed around the town? Will it threaten the power plant at all? Will it be further to the north where it might actually threaten the highway from the airport to the capital area? These are all questions that remain to be seen. Um, and so we'll just have to keep monitoring things as we go forward. I'll try to provide some uh, regular up, updates every few weeks or so, or whenever something big comes across uh, the radar, and I see some data that uh, warrant some sort of an update. So uh, thanks for your support of the channel. Hope you enjoyed these little updates on Iceland, and stay well, my friends. Take care.